evening, ladies, and welcome to our webinar. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, I am Philippa Cunniff, and I head up the family law team at Gilson Gray, and I'm joined by my glamorous assistant, Shona Young, who is an associate in the family law team. Um, so firstly, just a heads up that at some point there is likely to be either a screeching child or a barking dog in the background. They've been warned, but if I survive the whole seminar without that happening, I'll count myself lucky. Um, as you know, there was a poll to decide what topic we would present to you tonight. And Shona and I were really pleased that the cohabitation one was the one that was chosen because it's an area that is really misunderstood. Um, there are lots of myths surrounding what people think the law is surrounding cohabitation. So uh, the aim of tonight is to um, provide an overview of the law, uh, to explain what rights cohabiting couples have and more importantly don't have, and to give some insight as to how to approach things, either if you don't feel you want those rights to apply to your cohabiting relationship, or if the cohabiting relationship comes to an end and you're not quite sure how things work. So the, we'll have time for questions at the end, uh, but as Shona says, if it's something personal in nature, you might prefer to follow up with us afterwards. Our email addresses will be um, put up at the end. So if you would like to ask us anything specific, then feel free to drop either Shona or I a quick email. So um, what we're gonna talk about first is the myths that surround uh, cohabitation. And I've mentioned there are, there are quite a lot of misconceptions. Now, the most common myths about cohabitation are actually at opposite ends of the spectrum. So many people, I think this is a really common thing, assume that if they've lived with somebody for a long time, they have rights as a common law spouse. It's a phrase that we hear bandied about all the time. I'm a common law wife, I'm a common law husband. I've got a common law spouse. It's a really, really common thing for us to hear. At the other end of the spectrum, people assume that if they're not married, there are no rights, and so there's nothing that they need to worry about, there's nothing that they need to consider. Uh, neither of those things is actually true. Can I have the next slide, please, Shona? So common law marriage hasn't actually ever really existed in Scotland. Um, there was what was termed irregular forms of marriage. Um, but now back in the mists of time, that included things like being able to establish a marriage by something that's called promise followed by intercourse. So you would say, yes, of course, I'm going to marry you, sleep with somebody, and then you could establish a marriage. Now that would inevitably cause something of a problem these days if, if that were to happen. But by the 1940s, the only form of irregular marriage that was available while in Scotland was something called marriage by cohabitation with habit and repute. Now, it's important to bear in mind that that form of marriage didn't arise just because a couple had lived together for a long time. It wasn't about how long you'd been together necessarily. That was part of it, but it wasn't all of it. Not only did the couple have to have lived together for an extended period of time usually, but they also had to present themselves as a married couple for an extended period of time and to most people. So for example, it wouldn't have been possible to say, well, look, I told my 90 year old granny that we were married because the shock that I wasn't actually married would have killed her. That wouldn't have been enough. It had to be a general reputation that you were married. Um, and the bar was pretty high for that. And in many cases, the courts found that no, it wasn't a form of irregular marriage. It was just a cohabitation. So very often the bar wasn't met anyway. And this form of marriage, cohabitation, or marriage by cohabitation with habit and repute, a bit of a mouthful, was actually abolished back in 2006, uh, at which point um, legislation came into force. Now, in theory, it is still possible to try to establish marriage in this way, uh, where the cohabitation began before 2006. But personally, I, have, I haven't heard of any cases coming up. It was a pretty rare thing even before 2006. And I, I genuinely haven't even heard of a single case since. So I think it's, it's, if it hasn't completely died out, it's very much on the way. And I think, again, um, these days, cohabitation is perfectly socially acceptable. I mean, nobody bats an eyelid if people are living together and not married. So 
the circumstances in which people these days would be holding themselves out as a married couple will be few and far between. The, the need, to the extent that it might have arisen in previous times, just doesn't arise anymore. So again, I think we um, are not going to see very much of that as, as time goes on. Um, so as I say, at the other end of the spectrum, um, we have people assuming that there are no rights. So we can forget common law marriage, that doesn't exist. Um, to the extent that it ever did, it is no longer around. But the other end of the spectrum is what we refer to as the no ring, no problem attitude. And Shona is going to talk to you about that. Yeah, I think it is. Um, it's probably one of the most common things around um, you know, people of my age and a bit older as well. And you say, well, you know, yes, we've got a house together, but, you know, we're not married. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of as simple as that. And, and it's actually really not as simple as that. Um, and for that reason, back in 2006, these rights were introduced for cohabiting couples because often um, upon separation or upon death, um, you know, there could be potentially disastrous consequences um, for people financially and, and otherwise. And so it was kind of recognised that there was a need there for people in these relationships to have protections afforded to them. Um, before we kind of go on to talk about it, I think the one thing that I would say about the law is that it is pretty woolly. Um, the reality is, is that it is going to be overhauled in the, the nearish future. Um, but to put it into context, we have a whole act on family law, you know, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of pages. And for the inhabitants, right, it really is about two pages long um, and not particularly tested in the courts either. Um, so for both separation and in the event that a partner were to pass away, um, it's a bit tricky for us to say 100% what would happen in the event that something needs to go to court. But what we do know is, is that people have rights uh, and more and more we are seeing agreements regulating those rights um, and, and we are seeing court actions being raised in the event that the agreements aren't able to be reached. So I suppose Dealing firstly with separation, um, the law um, that, that was brought in um, it extends to anybody who is in a cohabiting relationship. It doesn't matter how long you've been together. Um, though obviously, if you've been cohabiting for twenty years, there's, there's probably um, there's probably more of an argument to be had about certain things than if you've been married, um, you've been living together for three months. Um, but certainly, um, we have seen cases where there has been a claim to be made in circumstances where cohabitation period has been very, very, very short. Um, so there's no minimum time um, and really it, it, the law kind of looks are you cohabiting as if you were a married couple and um, most people in relationships are um, so it, it really does apply to most people in relationships living together um, and um, some of the things that is introduced for example is that there is now an assumption that um, cohabitants will share equally in household goods and um, so before before the act came into place that was a bit confusing people didn't really know what would happen you know what, what if we bought something together what if they bought something whilst we were together and what applies to that so we, we know that um, and the kind of the big thing that we see coming up the most of separation is um, claims for financial provision so uh, I think probably the easiest thing to do is just to give an example of uh, one of the most common things that we see cropping up. And uh, that will be um, where people have bought an asset, most commonly a house, and there's been an unequal contribution towards that. So one person puts in the money for the deposit um, and thereafter, maybe they both equally contribute to the house. And in the event they separate, the title deeds are 50-50. And if you were to just look at that and say, well, you know, we both walk away with half the equity on the face of it, that, that doesn't seem particularly fair. So what we can do using the, the, the legislation that is now in place is advance an argument to say that, that fair sharing of those assets would involve a departure um, from 50-50. Um, and that, that usually is um, the starting point anyway, is to say that people should get back what they put in, but it, it, it's not quite as straightforward as that, but that's probably, um, one of the most common examples that we see. Um, and another might be um, where throughout the period, a, a very long relationship, um, that one of the partners has been using money that they've earned during that relationship to buy other things, to buy properties, building up a portfolio, for example, in their own names. 
um, uh, and the other um, partner might have assisted them in that, um, might have put efforts in towards helping grow that um, property empire for them, but because the name isn't on any of the title deeds, um, on the face of it, on separation, it, it's not theirs. Um, and, and in those circumstances, there would be um, a pretty compelling argument um, to be made that accounts should be taken of that and they should, they should get some money to compensate for that. Unlike in um, divorces, um, when you're a separating, um, cohabiting couple, you can't ask for specific things. So you can't ask for the house or um, a pension or a car. You have to ask for money. Um, so that, that's one of the things that we're probably expecting is likely to change um, in the near future um, to bring it more, more in line um, so that you don't have to look at you know, liquefying your assets. Um, but in the event that you, you can't agree, um, it, is, it is a case of asking the court to um, grant you a sum of money. Um, so that's where on the slides here, obviously, we have um, the potential, potential issues arising. So most common example, asset contributed to unequally. Um, and I mean, the other thing is, is that because of the uncertainty that, that does surround the law, um, it, it can be quite difficult where somebody is refusing to have sensible discussions with you and sometimes the only remedy is to to raise a court action just to force them to engage with you um but um as i say that that's all something um that can be dealt with if necessary um but as we'll talk about um shortly um if you have a cohabitation agreement in place you can kind of short circuit all of that and avoid the avoid the need for any of these discussions to happen because you go into it knowing what will happen um, in in the event that you do separate in relation to um, the position, um, if uh, a spouse was to pass away, um, again, this was brought in because there have been a series of um, cases where there seemed to be very, very unfair outcomes happening where people had been living together for a long time, but they weren't married and as cohabitants, they didn't have any right to make a claim um, on the estate of the person who for all intents and purposes was as if they were their husband or wife. Um, again, the law's not 100% clear, but we know that you can claim anything from zero to what a spouse would be able to claim um, in the event of, of the death of a husband or wife. Um, but um, again, this has kind of been commentary that and leading case on this actually um, says that no lawyer really advising um, can give a client accurate um, information as to, to what exactly will happen. Um, but the, the, the starting point would be um, that you could make a claim using this legislation to say that, that you should be able to be entitled to claim from the person's estate, but you can only do that if they don't have a will. So um, I think, you know, one of the, again, the biggest issues that we have seen is where somebody has a really, really old will, um, and then they enter into a relationship with a new person and you know, uh, they forget sometimes that they have the will. Um, and if they pass away, the legislation, the cohabitation legislation doesn't apply. It's not a, um, it's not something that the survivor can use. Um, uh, an example of um, a, a situation um, where that has been an issue would be where a um, couple had bought a house together. The um, woman had used her redundancy pay to actually buy the house um, and the uh, man had children from a previous relationship. He thought that his will only applied to assets in England, which he was sadly misinformed on. And when he passed away, his will left everything to his children, which meant that she, because of his will, couldn't make a claim for his half of the house. And moreover, she actually had to sell her house to buy his estate out. So it was catastrophic. Um, so, you know, I, I, again, I think it's one of those things that people just don't realize um, that, that it's maybe something that, you know, that they should get checked um, by a lawyer. And again, these cohabitation agreements that we can prepare deal with the position in relation to jointly owned assets. It, it sets it out and um, we, we distinguish it from wills and um, we make sure that um, everybody knows what will happen and that the estate knows what will happen as well. So that's kind of, it's really important um, that that stress and something that you think about if you are thinking of buying a house with a partner or, or if you actually already do have a house with a partner. Um, but as I say, it's, it's, it's the reality is, is that 
um, until we have a wee bit more clarity in the years to come and um, we're able to give you guidance and, and you know ultimately and um, we can work through it um, but it, it, it's not as clear as it could be but it's certainly better than nothing um, which, which is the situation in a, in a lot of places Scotland's considered to be quite progressive on this front um, which, which might be surprising to hear when when I tell you all of that but it's um, it's certainly a good thing. <laughs> We'll go back to Philippa. <laughs> so I think just before we move on to um, the areas in which we might be able to help you, I think the situation on death shown is obviously covered and having a will in place is such a simple, inexpensive thing to do. And yet, particularly in the context of cohabitation, it is such a an important thing you know particularly if you've got children together but even if you don't have children together it's massively massively important it's a, a will is so straightforward for many people it's um it doesn't cost a lot of money it doesn't take a lot of time it's not complicated for most people and yet shown has given some examples of situations where the consequences of somebody not having a will or not having an up-to-date will have been absolutely catastrophic so albeit the, the death side in terms of preparing wills and so on, um, is it something that's done by our colleagues rather than us? It's, it's a massively important part of, of what happens um, and what people should be thinking about. Also going back to the separation situation, we've talked about unequal contributions to assets and that's a, a, most of the cases that the courts have looked at in terms of cohabitation have, have dealt with unequal contributions of, of some sort. But one of the other angles that the courts can consider uh, relates to other contributions. So they might not be financial contributions. It might, for example, be doing the books in a business. It might be bringing up the children in a more traditional type of relationship. Uh, it could be the male partner. It could be the female partner. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. But all of these are contributions that might be relevant in assessing whether a claim can be made. So again, even if you have a situation where you think, well, I didn't contribute anything financially during the course of the relationship, it doesn't necessarily follow that there's no claim. So again, I think the important thing there is just about not making assumptions. I think we see so many situations where people assume that things um, are a particular way and they very rarely are. And one of the banes, I think, of any lawyer's life, but particularly family lawyer's life, is the friend. I've got a friend who X happened to. I've got a friend who told me, you know, that X did this or did that or did the next thing. Nine and a half times out of 10, in fact, probably 9.9 .9 times out of 10, whatever the friend has told the person is either not true, not complete, or applies to a completely different set of circumstances. So in particular, in relation to this area of law, it is really important to make sure that you arm yourselves with information uh, so that you know what the position is and you're not just assuming or listening to, you know, the friend who told you over two glasses of wine or more, uh, you know, some terrible story about what happened to somebody they knew. So again, really, really important. In terms of things that you can do, Shona's talked about what the law says, and the law is there as your safety net. So the law is there as the net to catch you if you fall, if there's nothing else. But what is far better is to forward plan to the extent that you can. So one of the um, areas of work that we are seeing a really significant growth in is cohabitation agreements, because the legislation that applies to cohabiting couples before that legislation was even passed. And it's worth saying, actually, that at the point the legislation came into force, there was a, a really lengthy consultation because there was a lot of pressure from certain groups in society saying, no, no, you shouldn't give cohabiting couples rights because that devalues marriage. You know, why will people bother getting married if um, they can have rights arising out of cohabitation? So there was a lot of discussion about it. Um, and on the other side of the spectrum, people were saying, well, whoa, hold your horses. You know, if, if we want rights, we'll get married. So there was a real kind of difference of opinion um, as to whether people should have rights and if so, what and how and, and so on. And when the legislation was published, it was accompanied by 
what's called a policy memorandum, which kind of comes out to explain the, the thinking behind the legislation. And it um, what that said is, look, if you don't want these rights to apply to you, you can opt out. So rather than asking people to opt in and say, yes, yes, we want these rights, the legislator said, no, this needs to be a safety net for people who might not know to go and opt into a system. So what they said is, if you don't like the concept of rights, of, of having to share, of having potential claims arising out of your cohabitation, you can opt out. And the way that you opt out is by entering into a formal a cohabitation agreement, which is simply a contract between the two parties to the cohabitation, setting out what they want to happen. Now, that could be really straightforward. It could just be, we do not want cohabitation rights, the rights set out in the legislation to apply to our relationship. It could be as straightforward as that. But what's more common in these agreements is for people to actually think about what it is that they want. And a very common thing that we see relates to property. So often the biggest asset that any couple, married or not, will have is, is their home. And where it's shown as talked about where the home is owned jointly and in equal shares, that's your starting position in terms of how the value is going to be divided. Now, a cohabitation agreement can, for example, where a deposit is being paid by one party or each party is putting an unequal amount in, that can record how those contributions are going to be reflected then that might be getting back your contribution before the rest is divided. If the property is sold, it might be um, taking uh, the equity in different proportions um, or it might be something else. It might cover lots of things. It might cover how you're going to fund expenses. It might cover a series of different things. So it can be anything from really, really straightforward and simple. I don't want these rights. We don't want them for whatever reason. Or it could be quite complex. And sometimes people, if they have, for example, a lot of jointly owned assets, they might think through each of those and try and work out what they want to do with those. Um, once that agreement is in place, it's a legally binding contract. Um, and as long as the right steps are taken to make sure that it's properly prepared, that it discharges the right, the right rights, the correct rights, um, and that the right hoops are jumped through, then that is a contract and it would be incredibly difficult for either side to get out of it. And the right hoops include things like not presenting somebody with um, a back of a fag packet document to sign and expecting that to be binding, uh, not asking somebody to sign something without legal advice or putting them under pressure, not asking them to sign it after 15 margaritas, you know, some fairly obvious things and some not. But the bottom line is, again, if you get proper legal, legal advice, a decent solicitor will guide you through that process and make sure you do jump through the right hoops so you, that you end up with a document that is going to stand you in good stead going forward. At the other end of the spectrum, obviously agreements ideally are at the beginning or in the middle um, rather than at the end. Sometimes we are dealing with agreements for people who have... Um, whose relationship has come to an end. And of course, we can then put in place formal agreements dealing with what's going to happen. But forward planning is really key with this kind of thing. And you're far better thinking about these things before there's a problem rather than after. And that sounds really um, obvious and slightly cliched, but nonetheless, it's true. Likewise, if you have been cohabiting with somebody and the relationship has ended or your partner has died and you weren't married, get legal advice and get it quickly. Uh, Shona's alluded to the fact that at the moment there is a review underway as to what changes should be made to the law relating to cohabiting couples and it's fully expected that there will be changes. But as matters stand at the moment, any claim that you want to make on death so if your partner dies and you are not married and you want to make a claim, you must do that within six months of the of death. So that's a really short time frame, actually, when you are grieving and trying to cope with all of the practicalities of a partner dying. And if you separate and your partner is still alive, then the claim has to be made within one year of separation. And 
it doesn't happen terribly often, but I've certainly had a number of cases over the years where people have come to see me after the year and we have to say to them, look, I'm really sorry, but there is nothing we can do for you because the, it's not um, a timeline that the court can extend. It, it, it doesn't matter what happens. You know, it, it is an absolute black line. That's it. If you miss the deadline, you don't have a claim. And I, I always remember one lady who had been to see a solicitor, um, hadn't got on with them, hadn't got particularly great advice and came to see me. Um, and it was literally, I think, two days after the end of the one year. And I had to say to her, look, I'm desperately sorry. And if ever there was a case where somebody deserved a payment, it was her case. Um, it was quite a sad and, and complicated situation, but there was nothing that could be done. And that uh, put her in an impossible position. And that really is the absolute worst case scenario for someone. And again, just a word of caution, if you know people who cohabit in England, if they separate from their partner, they have no rights as a cohabitant, but if they have children together, they have certain rights to make claims in respect of the children that we don't have in Scotland. So again, don't assume that because you've got a friend, a relative, whoever in England, who did X, Y, or Z, you'll be in the same position because Scots law is completely different and it's really important to bear that in mind. Is that our last, last slide, Shona? I think, as I say, that is, uh, again, it's, it comes up so commonly that people just assume that the law in England is the same as Scotland on this. And it, it, I see really, it really couldn't, couldn't be more different at the moment. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just, that's all really just really common um, misconception there, I suppose. Maybe that's another myth we've just busted. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Absolutely. But I think um, I don't think we've got any questions on the Q&A. But as Shona and I have said, if there are any questions that you would like to put to us, whether it's a general one or something specific to your own circumstances, then um, do feel free to drop either uh, Shona or I a message actually a question has just popped up about East Lothian yes we um, have an office in North Berwick um, and Shona will generally be the face that you will see around there uh, but all of us are, are in North Berwick at, at some stage but yes the North Berwick office is um, alive and kicking and uh, ready for business so uh, very well placed to deal with any of you East Lothian ladies but do feel free to drop us an email if anything comes up um, either now or at a later point, and we'll be delighted to help. Thank you everyone for coming along. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Good night.